All right, so we're going to be talking about how collective consciousness actually changes and affects our physical world. So this is going to bring into, into conversation, so everything you're seeing out there, all the chaos that may be happening, all the great things that are happening, all the you know, different beliefs and stuff that are coming to the surface, all the, the new changes, right, or the things that stay in place, everything is affected by collective consciousness. And, if, and collective consciousness is constantly evolving and each and every one of us is tied into it. So what we're going to do is we're going to explain how collective consciousness plays a role in actually affecting our physical world such that we can understand why a shift in consciousness is at the forefront of how we are going to see change. The collective consciousness is a precursor to the actual physical solutions, thus change starts within and that's where we got to focus. So if we're waiting on physical solutions to come and fix everything, we're going to see how that is not going to happen until we first change ourselves and empower ourselves to actually make these changes from a different place within ourselves. So collective consciousness, this is the way it works, right? Imagine, for lack of a better way of thinking about it, that there's this massive bubble, if you will, sitting above the planet. And each and every one of us is tied via, whether you want to view it as a cord, a wire, whatever it may be. We're all tied into collective consciousness, having our experience. We are, and it's hard to see this, but this is basically receiving and sending. We're all receiving and sending to collective consciousness. We're receiving essentially various things about how our world is, how it works, how it's set up, how we, you know, believe and understand things, some of the more metaphysical understandings that exist with, we're going to go through the experience, we're all souls, we're connected, we're, we're going through an evolutionary process, but we also receive things like, you know, diving into this one, for example, like the four minute mile, right? If you don't know this story, it's essentially stating things around human limitation. What we believe as a collective is possible. So the four minute mile is essentially someone had set out to basically run a one mile, you know, around a track in four minutes. And it was believed, and even scientifically, people were trying to come forth and say this, that this was impossible, that nobody could do this. And you would see people as they would get literally within like meters of the finish, they would just collapse and fall apart or slow down so much that they couldn't pass it. Because the effect of collective consciousness, the belief of the collective was so strong that people were in, engaging with it enough that it was stopping their physical reality and even the production of that as an option so much that it couldn't happen. Then one day someone who truly, truly believed this was possible went beyond in essence, the confines of collective consciousness and completed the four minute mile. Not long after that, and again, you don't understand, this was being tried many times beforehand and everybody kept failing. Not long after that, someone else did it, and then someone else did it, and then someone else did it, and all of a sudden now, so many people were able to do the four minute mile. Now, this wasn't just because suddenly everybody was trying to do it. This was literally because people were beginning to realize it was possible. And now, all of a sudden, you weren't seeing the collapse happening at the end of the four minute mile. You were seeing people able to finish through. And you've seen this in your own life. When you, when you believe something is impossible, but then you see someone else do it, suddenly you're able to do it very easily. And you can also see the path to which something like this is done. So the four minute mile was an example of sort of stepping beyond some collective consciousness in, in, in actually getting things to actually happen in our physical world. Now what I want to do is talk about how collective consciousness, right, actually inhibits or allows, and it's not as an inhibitor, it's as a set of rules that we set up and we tap into and we decide as a collective. Now the reason why it's important to view it this way is that when we want to understand why our world is the way it is, why things continue to stay stuck, why different presidents come into the limelight and, and be who everybody's looking at and everybody was paying attention to, right? We did this video on Trump talking about this. We essentially bring things forward based on what collective consciousness needs, right? I.e. all of us, what we need, agree to, understand, also to help us evolve because collective, collective consciousness is always evolving, right? So collectively, we decide this is the best option for us to continue to learn, grow, and evolve when someone like Trump, for example, comes into power. This is the best option. Why? Because there's so many things, as we discussed in the previous video, for us to reflect on with that. So in this particular case, right, collective consciousness, let's look at, you know, 
curing an illness. So you ask the question, why are some people able to cure an illness just with their thoughts, their minds, their good intentions, versus other people who may not be able to do that? So what ends up happening in this particular instance is you have essentially the placebo effect playing out. Now, the placebo from a scientific perspective is sort of this like inconvenient little thing, this power of the mind, so to speak, that makes it so that it's difficult to measure the introduction of something external in someone's healing journey, right? But in reality, what the placebo effect is, is showing us the power of our own mind, our own consciousness over a specific instance, right? And so when it comes to curing an illness, why are we sometimes able to see it and sometimes we're not, if collective consciousness in the majority of the world typically believes that, you know what, I, I, I need to, to have some sort of external practice of, of taking a medication in order to heal, right? If that's the main belief, and most people keep going to medicine and medicine and medicine, yet then there's those odd cases, those phenomena that we can't quite explain, where people are healing themselves without the use of, of any form of medication. What they're actually doing is they are looking at, you know, again, if we're looking at a weighted system, right? So let's say on this particular issue of curing an illness, so we'll call it illness, right? And, um, you know, let's say it's weighted for the sake of explanation in the collective consciousness that like 60% of people believe that you need an external medication, whereas 40% of people believe, hey, you know what, it is possible. It makes it so that these particular instances of, of, of curing an illness there's a lot more knowledge, upload and download, of possibility for this available within collective consciousness that it makes this possibility a lot easier. Because it's possible to cure an illness because enough people are putting that belief into the collective consciousness, which we have access to, which begins to shape our external world, right? Then you look at monks flying, for example. Now this is something that most people haven't even heard of, but there's a ton of eyewitness cases and there's a ton of people who say, yes, in areas of Tibet and so forth, where there's very, very practiced monks, you will sometimes see them flying through the air, whether in lotus position, whether they're levitating, whether they actually just sort of fly through the sky, right? Does this look like an airplane? I imagine not. But from the cases that I've seen, sometimes it's them levitating, um, you know, quite high off the ground. Sometimes it's them actually moving in a jumping manner that is very high and going through the air, right? These are, these are how when people say monks are flying, you know, this is what it actually looks like. So then you think the question, well, hold on a second. If I sit there and I go, and I, and I work really, really hard to believe I can fly, why is it that I'm unable to? Why is it that I work really, really hard to believe that if I drink this poison, I won't die? I may still die. So going back to collective consciousness, talking about the weighted example, for something like monks flying, you might have the weight of, you know, only 5% of humans, you know, believe that um, that's possible, whereas 95% of them say that's absolutely impossible. So within collective consciousness, you have this very, very, very limited belief that this is even possible. So in order to break the effects of collective consciousness on your individual journey enough that you can in essence step beyond the confines of what we collectively define as possible and in essence do your own thing, i.e. say flying, like with your physical body, it's so difficult. So you need to work incredibly hard and only very, very few people with the, with the, with the, the patience and the, the, the commitment to practice can get this to happen. Now here's where it gets interesting for every single one of us. What happens when this starts to become normal? Just like we saw with the four minute mile. It starts to become normal that, hey, this is possible. Now all of a sudden this scale starts to shift slightly and now you have 20% of people believing and then 40 and then 50, and then 60, and so on and so forth. And thus, the physical confines that we agree are our world begin to shift because we agree to those physical confines in a lot of ways via collective consciousness. And in an everyday sense, which we're gonna get into right here, we see the effects of collective consciousness such that we believe deeply 
in the system when we're very like this is the way we're supposed to do it we go and we vote and we have politicians and they do our thing and we believe very deeply in the need for monetary exchange because that is how we buy things and that's how we do things and you can't come onto the planet and suddenly just have everything met for you because humans are these pathetic little beings that need to fight and need to have exchange and we can't have abundance and these people always want to take things from these people and so forth and thus we take these beliefs we put them into collective consciousness, they seed the experience of everybody, and we now create this world that reflects collective consciousness, what we believe. Whereas if we study, you know, let's get into a couple more examples. We have a limited idea of life, right? Even that we upload it into collective consciousness. Well, we gotta wake up, or we go to work, we, you know, we come home, we you know, feed the, you know, the family or whatever may do and we repeat the process and that's what life is. And you know, we kind of we're just supposed to accept and we're supposed to expect that, you know, sometimes people are, are shitty and sometimes this happens and you know, you kinda of just gotta go and get an education. You gotta do all these things and you know, here's the path of life and that's pretty much what it is, and you might as well just walk down it and that's you know, that's what life is, right? That's what we're capable of as humans. We need pain for gain is another big one in collective consciousness. And this is like one of those ones where it's like, hold on a second. What do you mean? You know, our pain and suffering is what shows us the light. Not true. That's a mental belief that we all have. Yes, pain and suffering can show us light, just as light can show us light. We don't need to necessarily have pain in order to grow and evolve. Pain can help you grow and evolve, and it's an option, but we don't need to have suffering all the time on our planet. We don't need to have pain all the time on our planet. It's not necessary. It's there, it can be helpful, it's used as a tool, but it doesn't have to be there. When we create the belief system that the only way forward is to first have pain, we are going to have pain anytime we want to move forward. It's a belief system. We're, we have the ability to be flexible with our consciousness, with collective consciousness, such that we can change things, we can move and evolve without the need for a very intense level of rigidity and then pain, and then suffering, and then we move forward. That's an old story that's been playing out for a very long time. And with all of this, we have the opportunity to evolve beyond that, just as we do with all of this stuff. So what the summary of this really is, and what I want to get at, is when we start to change our belief and our understanding, so for example, when we start to understand how our world really functions, so the conspiracy side, as some people like to call it, right? Really all we're doing is examining how things work. You wanna call that a conspiracy, you can call it a conspiracy all you want. But when we start to realize how the world actually works, who's in control and what's playing out, some people like to say that's negative, that's not useful to us. Well, it's entirely useful. Because when we're believing what we're believing about the world, right, which is a creation of those that are manipulating and in control of everybody, we get stuck believing this stuff, which produces a world where we're all kind of suffering and we're not really feeling what we want to feel. And we, know we don't want to experience it. The human experience feels old. It feels outdated. It feels like we were ready for a change. We're ready for a shift. Well, these people are creating that idea within collective consciousness and they're holding us down in that specific state. You know, one of the biggest reasons why so much of this conspiracy stuff, as we call it, happens is because they're trying to limit collective consciousness and what we believe is actually possible. It's more beneficial to have you think that humans are animals that are chaotic and that need governance than it is to state that humans are beings that have incredible potential and that we can step beyond the need for a lot of this stuff because how are you going to govern those people? How are you going to limit those individuals, right? But that's also part of our journey of evolving beyond that story. That's why this is happening. So if we want our everyday world to change, we have to start believing and seeing that it's possible that we don't necessarily need politicians in the form that we have. And that, yeah, they've been manipulating us in specific ways. We need to understand that who says we need a system of monetary exchange all the time? Why does it have to be like that? Could we not dream up something different? Who says that life is supposed to be limited to just, you know, wake up and go to school and you do this and whatever? Is that not just a story we tell ourselves within collective consciousness and suddenly everybody in the world is doing it? And then you have some people who step off that path and have an easy time while others think, no, that's totally not possible. It's easy for some of us because there's a split belief 
a lot of people think, hey, you know what? You can step off and do what you want. And other people think, no, you got to absolutely do this, right? So there's different weighted aspects of how we're limited by it and how it's difficult. So sometimes when we say our thoughts create our reality, if I just think I can drink this poison, well, within collective consciousness, that poison has a shit ton of power. And you would have to work really hard to be able to consume that poison to overcome the power that collective consciousness has on that. Our agreement within society, within our, our game here, in order for that not to poison us from a physical level. So yes, our consciousness creates reality, but we have to bring in this collective consciousness factor to truly understand how that functions, right? So the end of the day, how this affects us right now is if we want change, we gotta start changing within so that we change the upload, download, in essence, of what we believe is possible and adding it up into collective consciousness. And instead of just downloading the limited old ideas of what everything is, we start seeing that, hey, there's other possibilities that we can start tapping into. We can start seeing, hey, that's possible and I believe that's possible and I upload that experience. I go and I do something that is outside the box that uploads that experience to the collective consciousness, allowing others to say, hey, you know what, I feel that's possible. If we don't change within first, the physical solutions are not going to come. When we try and bring in physical solutions based on our limited collective consciousness, say 3D level of consciousness, where we think we still need all this stuff, we're going to keep repeating the same cycle over and over and over again. When we start believing and questioning truly what is possible, what we're capable of, how did this come into being? How did this come into being? How did this come into being? Are we really limited to this stuff? Is this the rule of society and this is how it has to be? Or can we step beyond that? Upload that experience to collective consciousness and watch the world change. Watch what happens when people begin to accept that it's possible to do something that we once thought was impossible. That's the power of collective consciousness. That's how we're going to change this world. It starts right here. Mm -hmm.